your your time, your one hour that you waste today, you're never getting it back. So if this is not working and you've beat that horse so many times, you need to know when to tell yourself, keep walking and walk away from that. Hey, Ta, Bulelani Balabala here. Welcome to the Small Business Podcast. We bring you weekly information, practical skills, and mentorship from industry professionals. This podcast is powered by T, an initiative that has directly impacted over 50,000 plus small businesses nationwide. This podcast is for small business owners who want to start, run, and grow their business. Follow us on all our social media platforms. Hashtag join us for T. Every Wednesday is a new podcast. Hello, guys. Good morning, good evening, wherever you're watching this podcast from. Thank you so so much for joining the Small Business Podcast, episode 28. Oh, man, it's a big one for us. Thank you, guys, for supporting us. And I think if you're watching this um, on YouTube or any other platform, thank you. Just, you know, I think just by way of engagement, you know, on the comment section, just tell us who you are, what your business does or what you do professionally and, you know, what what, what your thoughts are on this podcast. I mean, today we've gone international. I was like, Hi. you know, we, we, we today we've gone international. We've got an amazing lady in studio. Um, you know, I think we, we, we hosted you at one of our platforms the past couple of uh, days and she really just blew us away. And I think before then, I mean, you know, a, a mutual friend of ours, um, service provider of theirs, Teho, has just spoken so much. Health God, health God. Give it to, what is health God? <laughs> Who is this Lavelle? Oh, Lavelle is so amazing. Lavelle. I was like, now nah, I want to meet her. And then fate, as fate would have it. Uh, we sort of met, but, you know, she she's a force and a powerhouse who's done tremendously well in the industry that she's in. And I think just by way of introduction, um, Lavalyn Basie is an entrepreneur and chief operating officer at HealthGuard International, um, you know, which is which is and, and that's the which is why I said we've gone international which is mm. and that's the pinnacle right it's an international yes. impact company that is woman led now 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 she runs health guard international currently over in over 8 countries and 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 in its continuous development across Africa and the world madam how are you I'm fine, thank you, sir. How thank are you, you? No, no, I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm really great to have you here in studio. Yeah. Um, I think also, you know, it's, it's, it's really appreciated having someone of your caliber. And I think in this moment in time, having someone of your caliber, having someone who's a lady who's just charting and redefining industries that were pre- pre- predominantly male-owned, that yeah. didn't have space for women ownership, charting the direction. Mm-hmm. And I think just basic jealous my jealousy is is primarily at the fact that it's a woman who's really just disrupting spaces because we've seen guys <laughs> talk about this and talk about that and peacocking and just having you in the studio today is a great honor oh, thank you the honor is mine thank the you so is- so i think just by way of maybe just opening up and breaking the ice tell us a bit about yourself where are you from and were sure. you always on this entrepreneurial journey Oh, where I'm from. I was very tempted at the beginning when you when you called me madam. I was very tempted to say hi, Olga. Ah. Yes, because <laughs> I am originally from Nigeria, but um, I've been in South Africa for most of my life. Then if you divided it, South Africa is home for me. Yeah. Um, studied at University of Pretoria. I got my law degree there. You know, growing up, you see those legal movies and I wanted to be a lawyer and parents said, you got to be a lawyer. Everybody said, you're going to be a lawyer. So what did I do? I went ahead and became a lawyer (laughs) because that was it. But um, over the years, I then decided I wanted to study so much while working and went ahead and got myself three masters. Don't ask me, I know one is enough, but I went ahead and got three. The third one is an MBA which um, I'm getting, I'm going for my graduation next week. But it was mainly because I felt that in, in this stage of my life, if I wanted to get any degree, I need to get it now and out of the way. And once I'm done with my degrees, I'm not studying anymore for no more degrees. <laughs> I am definitely done because it took a lot for me to actually finish up the last one. But, um, you know, over time, practice, did the law thing, still do the law thing. I still have my license valid for South Africa and New York. Um, 
But I then decided, you know, a few years ago, my this is the business, you know, health get started from us representing another company, being mm. distributors for another company, for another brand in Nigeria. And that is actually what we used to put me through school. That's what paid for all of my education, my entire life and all of that. And we decided, this was now in 2018, we thought to ourselves, um, we've been representing someone now for 16 years. Why don't we just start ours? We've got the economies of scale, we mm. might as well. Um, first of all, we're like, so want to start ours, software, where'd you get it from? And all of that. But at the end of the day, because we were so determined, it did not matter which country we needed to contact to get things done. We went for it. And 2020, just at the beginning of COVID, we launched our company. Sure. Just before COVID. Right. And I mean, how was, so, but. But I mean, just give me give me give me an idea because I think mm-hmm. oftentimes people sort of make the jump from these professional careers mm-hmm. to entrepreneurship. How was the transition for you? Um, for me, it was. I'll tell you. For me, it was quite easy. And the reason it was easy for me is, growing up, my mom, my dad died when I was about three or four, so my mom raised us by herself. Um, and she left government work very early because she wanted to do her own business. She, she said something that she had one of, one of the people that retired in her office came to visit them. And she saw how this person looked. And she looked at that person and thought to herself, is this what I'll look, look like in retirement? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> the next month she resigned and she started her own business. So throughout school, we had one business or the other running in the family. And from when I was old enough, about, you know, 11, 12, when I could physically be in the store, um, I would go to the store, you know, sit there, sell to customers. This is when we we had a business and a supermarket. Um, But before then, while I was still in primary school, actually, um, we had a business center and I went there and I learned how to type learned how to use a computer. I would ask them, please, can I type the letter for the customer? So I got very involved in it. And of course, I would ask to get paid. Yeah. Like I thought for my services rendered, I needed to get paid. Yeah, and yeah. I would beg for money, even if it's just to buy a sausage roll, mm. and, and they would give it to me. So that kind of built up a culture for me. And even when I went to high school, um, during the breaks, I would go work at the shop, and it was a thing for me. So I was part of growing the family business. I was actively involved in this whole entrepreneurship life. So when I decided that, okay, this is it now, I'm done, um, and, I'm, and I'm going the full entrepreneurship ro- um, road, it wasn't mu- it was really a no-brainer. It was mm. just a natural thing for me. And I'll say this to you, one of the reasons because some people say to me but why don't you just why don't you just go work for your mom immediately after varsity the opportunity was there um but i wanted to work for other people so Mm. i could get Mm. an idea of other people's values the way other people worked the way it is to work in an outside environment i wanted that experience before going back to family because it opens your eye a bit more now my mom is my boss Mm-hmm. So I am really glad I worked for somebody else first before working for my mom full time. Yeah, yeah, because then uh, that helps mm. from a deliverable perspective so that you don't consistently think that it's family, right? Exactly. And then, I mean, just <clears throat> so you so you launched, you know, February 2020, just mm-hmm. before, you know, this whole COVID pandemic. Mm-hmm. How did you navigate that, right? Uh, how, how did you sort of navigate through COVID uh, sorry, not even through COVID, but through these harsh lockdowns. And mm. here you are today, you know, beaming with this thriving business Ooh. that's in eight countries, you know, having launched, you know, a month before this global pandemic hit. It was it was quite a shocker because I can remember when we launched, when we did, in Nigeria, we did four launches instead of one in four strategic locations, with the last one having about 2,500 people in the hall. And... Um, the night before, I think we were watching CNN or one of the news channels, and we saw it was just a byline, you know, 
COVID or something in China and it's a pandemic. It's, it's a virus there. It was a Chinese thing as far as we were concerned. And, you know, we were making jokes about it that it wouldn't come this side. So when it finally came this way, it was a huge shock for us yeah. because we had all these plans about the road shows we were going to do and how we're going to expand the business and be in touch with people, be on the ground with people. Because this, the business we are in, network marketing, for years, the history of the business is that it's a person-to-person -person business. Mm. And that physical contact matters a lot. Now we're told we cannot meet with people. And I'm thinking, uh, what are we supposed to do if we can't meet with people? Mm. Well, I couldn't even leave the country. I literally got back to South Africa and we're told, oh, you can't travel anywhere anymore. So I'm like, okay, well, that's great. <laughs> but the other, the, and yeah. one of the great, one of the things for us was that a lot of our people are also either illiterates or um, the, their level of education is very low or they're just not tech savvy. Mm. So that's the majority of our people. So now I have to tell this, tell them that you can, there's another way to do your business and it's online. And they're looking at me like, wait, what are you talking about? Yeah. No, yeah. online is all about Facebook and mm. we just check mm. people on Facebook and post all kinds of things. So it was a mind shift. So we had to come up with ways to train people to stay in touch with them. And it was a huge transformation for us, but we had to immediately take our business fully online. Um, but I found I, this on the web. Oh my goodness! No, 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 it's perfect. Sorry about this that. This is this is <laughs> this is entrepreneurship, and this is actually what actually happens. And this is the show, by the way, and because because I, I encourage guests answer oh the phone goodness. because it needs to depict as true a reality as possible. Oh well, we should have told the the thing not to talk <laughs> back when I'm talking. <laughs> But um, it, it was quite a mind shift for us, trying to train people who, who believed that their smartphone was only for Facebook, that they could not do business um, online. But one of the great things was that uh, Nigeria had a, a much harder lockdown than South Africa, mm. because South Africa had a lot of things in place. Um, I know we all criticized the government for not being sufficient enough and not taking care of it enough. But sometimes when you put it into perspective with the rest of Africa, yeah. you find that South Africa actually did a lot, a lot better. There were permits. People could get permits to run their businesses or to keep certain businesses open. But Nigeria went into a lockdown straight without all of those permits being in place. So you couldn't even move to go to the market to get food. Mm. So it was quite harsh. But, you know, one of the things with Nigerians is try to stop them from earning a living for <laughs> one month. They could bear it for one month. After that, they're like, uh, no, thank you. We mm. are braving it and we're going out. Yeah. So that was it. The one month people were like, oh, maybe not. This will blow over. When they saw that they, they, they couldn't earn money, the next month they were like, what is that thing you were saying about buying, selling online? Can we mm. have a conversation <laughs> about it? And that was how we got everybody, started getting everybody together. And our people started selling, they started making money. And, and we couldn't have gotten through COVID without our consultants. Hmm. We wouldn't have. If they had not been so determined to make money, and in spite of COVID, our company would have gone under. Now, I think for the benefits of everyone listening, mm. who is HealthGuard International? What does HealthGuard do? Ah, yes. <laughs> now you've got me. HealthGuard International is a network marketing company. So it's one of those businesses where you sell our products, you get a profit, and you recruit a team, you get a commission. Um, it is, it, it, you know, it, it's, it, it's, got a, it's got quite a number of competitors out there. And they get, some people call it direct selling, other people call it network marketing. But um, one of the unique things about our company is that we are, 100% African owned, um, and we are we are the first major Black African owned network marketing company oh. out there. Wow. And our products are, are really health products. So think about it. Like even in a pandemic, you're going to sell because mm. it's health products. Mm. So that's who we are essentially. But beyond what we stand, what we do as a company in terms of you know, if someone asks me what is HealthGuard, I give you the the, the <coughs> highlight and all of that. We've got 
people who are who we call our consultants and these are individuals who are actually entrepreneurs in their own right yeah we give them an, a, a platform so i consider us actually as a platform where entrepreneurs can come and create their own individual business and opportunity and decide how small or how big their individual businesses will be so one of not even one of but what who well, I'll say one of one of the mantras I picked up right says um the worst anyone can ever tell you is no mm-hmm. right uh, never be afraid of failure and I'll, I'll sort of and I'll sort of pause it there um how then have you sort of navigated through failure because you know failure and entrepreneurship are almost married together to a degree mm. right because so many challenges so many no's so you know and sometimes you know, the, uh, and I think sometimes your state of being or your state of mind can't necessarily fathom or differentiate between a no that's a temporary no or that's a permanent no. So sometimes we then mm-hmm. consider every no as a permanent no. Mm-hmm. How did you, number one, how, how, how do you work around that on a daily? Mm-hmm. And then how then have you built up the strong mindset that says that I'm not going to rest on my laurels, I'm not going to rest on my no's, I'm not going to rest on my failures. I'm going to redefine, level in each and every day and go out into the market. Yeah, um, the failure, <laughs> failure, I know it's like you said, it's a marriage, you can't really divorce it from an entrepreneur. Um, it's a life sentence, actually. F- um, no failure and an entrepreneur together for, for life, you can never get away from it. But one of the things that really prepared me was when I was still in the job market. Um, here is me, you know, I consider myself fairly intelligent. Um, got my degrees, did all of that. And I'm in the job market and I couldn't get a job. You know, it was either I was overqualified or underqualified or I'm not South African. One of the three Mm. hit me each time. And there was a time that in a space of one week, I had applied for over 100 positions. And guess what? All of them came out. To I got a response from only about 10. Ten were kind enough to say to me, um, no, um, you are overqualified or no, you're underqualified. One actually invited me for an interview out of curiosity. Just pure curiosity, not because they wanted to hire me, Mm. but because they were curious to actually meet this person who had these qualifications and was actually applying to the company. Well, that really upset me because I thought they absolutely wasted my time. But... I got so I got to this point where I got so many no's, but it never stopped me from applying again and again and again. Because one company turning me down does not mean the next company was going to turn me down. One company thinking I was overqualified did not mean the next would not see me as a good fit. And eventually, um, it was an, in, an international law firm that actually then hired me. They were coming into South Africa. They had only spoken to me over the phone, never met me in person. They hired me to set up their South African company and gave me money to do it without actually physically meeting me. (laughs) And I did all of this. And it was only after I had signed the lease for the new office that my boss actually flew into the country to meet me face to face. So it was such a huge trust that he put in me without actually meeting me. Um, But... He said something to me. He said, you know what? I think that your background as a Nigerian and the fact listening to you talk about how many times you've tried to get in the job market, your drive and the fact that you're still doing it. I believed in you the moment we finish having a conversation Mm. that you can do this. And that was validation for me for all of the other no's. After I left that firm, um, we then, I then tried again to get back in the job market and I, you know, hit the same nose. And at that point, I then decided, you know what, I'm just going to go into entrepreneur now. I think I've now, I've now exhausted this pool. Let yeah. me just go to yeah. that pool. And the first thing I decided to do was actually start a grocery, a grocery store. So here I am, I tell my family, we're starting a grocery <coughs> store. And I go and I start this grocery store. And it was very difficult because it involved importing and exporting, and I didn't know much about it. But, you know, I still, I don't have to know everything about it, but I went in with the zeal and with, the, with an open mind to learn about it. And that was what I did. 
um, I learned through it. And there were times that, you know, I really thought that my store was going to go under. Mm. But mm. every time I'm like, yeah, it's not good this month, but it's going to get better next month. What did I do wrong that month? What can I change going forward? And when I then went into my family business of health, got full time, with, with, you know, with everything that has happened, there are people that we try to recruit into our business, into our health guard business, and they tell us, no, they don't want to join. Mm. And I say, it's okay. Yeah. You know, you move on to the next person because there are lots of people out there. So um, one of the things I've also come to say to myself is that if this person says no to me, it means that that is not what God wants me to do. Yeah. And that's not where God wants me to be. And even if it takes me much longer to get to where God wants me to be, and I need to get through a couple of more no's to get there, it's going to be tiring. It's going to be sad sometimes. Mm. And sometimes you have to take, uh, you have to run like crazy. Well, I mean, physically, physically run. Because there was a day I was so pressed on all sides. Mm. The only Mm. thing I could think of was getting out of my house and running till my legs hurt. And then I went back home and I'm like, great, let's do this again. <laughs> and it's not the end of the world. We're yeah, going to get through this. Yeah. And a few days later, that whole situation changed. But I needed my head to be clear. Hmm. So a no is a no for now. It's not where you need to go to. But you need to also see the no in clarity and put every no in perspective so that it doesn't cloud the next step you're going to take. What is the, <clears throat> what is the one lesson not even the one, but one of some. What are some of the lessons that you learned along the entrepreneurial journey that just really helped you change how you view business? The one I'm learning recently is that when you need money to invest in your business, nobody wants to give you money to invest in your business. Mm. When you don't need money, everybody's going to give you money to invest in your business. <laughs> so, um, but you know when. Your vision for your life and your business is exactly what it is, your vision. It's not anybody else's vision. So because it is unique to you and it is yours, people don't always see it. They don't always see the bigger picture that you see. They don't always understand your plans that you're trying to put in place to build your business as an entrepreneur. So it's up to you to make them see it. And there are times you need to accept that they are not going to understand it, no matter how you explain it to them. And um, one of the things I've learned in that situation, like many others, you need to know when to stop wasting your time. Mm. Your, your time, your one hour that you waste today, you're never getting it back. So if this is not working and you've beat that horse so many times, you need to know when to tell yourself, keep walking and walk away from that. So it is how we, it's the only way to grow in business. Otherwise, you'll be stuck in one place and you will never move forward. Is there a way of knowing? I mean, I think this is something I struggled with years ago as an entrepreneur and definitely, definitely do know a lot of entrepreneurs or if just mm-hmm. individuals struggle with this, right? Is there a way of just clearly defining, you know, or clearly pointing out that I've done whatever I need to here? Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, 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 I've propositioned this client as much as I potentially can. Mm-hmm. Now it's time to go. Because sometimes, you know, you continue to just keep knocking mm-hmm. on that door and you waste that time and that energy. Is there a way of finding out or is it just emotional intelligence that needs you just click in? I think it's really emotional intelligence. Mm. Because if you are, if you are, if your emotional intelligence is developed enough, you will be able to read between the lines at all mm. times. People give off different body languages, even over the phone. You can hear it in the tone of their voice. If somebody is not interested in your business, um, is not interested in supporting your business, even as a customer, you can tell in their body language. The more you talk to them, you can also tell in their body language if they're buying into what you're saying or not. So you need to be able to make that call when when that bridge comes to say, now I'm wasting my time. Um, you know, to be quite honest, you know, I've, I've spoken to some, I, I spoke to, I spoke to some, a, a potential investor, I think two, two weeks ago. And, um, after a while, after speaking to him and trying to explain to him, this is the way my business works. We had been at this for over a week, really. 
And he then came back to me and said, um, after considering everything, um, we're not going to go ahead with the investment in your business. And I said, and he asked me, did I have any feedback or anything to say to him? So I thought to myself, is this the part where I'm supposed to be polite? Mm. You know, and this is something that entrepreneurs struggle with. Mm. When someone tells you no, do you, pol do you take it politely and with grace and give a dignified response? Or do you just hang up the phone or walk out the door and just blank them out? Um, and I said to him, well, it, I don't have much to say, but it is a shame that you don't understand the way my business works, despite all of my explanations. Um, but it's all good. You know, it's not you win some, you lose some. And it is what it is. Mm. And I left it at that. I, I, I had made up my mind. I would not try to repitch my business to him again, because here I am trying to expand, expand my business all over Africa and across the world. And again, it's my vision. So um, no matter what a person tells me, even if they tell me no, they tell me something I don't I don't like, even if it's by email. Guess what? I actually always reply with a thank you for your response. I may not like the answer, but I do it. Now, the primary driver, I think, in your business, but in every business, in any case, is sales, mm. right? Yes. Um, how do you get someone to buy? A product? Have you, have you oh. you've sold the product yourself? Yes. Oh, yes. And that's one of some of the things I've picked up. Oh, <laughs> I sell my products. Like, are even they? if you're sitting next to me on a plane, you are not safe. I am selling <laughs> to you. Right? I sell my products everywhere. Yeah. You and know? I love that. You know what? I love that. You know what it speaks to? It speaks to always being ready to sell mm -hmm. and always having your product in hand. Mm -hmm. But what are, I mean, are there, are there any, I don't know, not even necessarily practical, but mm -hmm. what are some of the Loveland sales? Um, oh my goodness. Um, I don't know whether <laughs> to call them tips, but it's just one of them in your magic box. Um, <coughs> one of the things I say to, to people that try to sell things, um, and this is part of the training that we give at HealthGuard because we offer our people free training as well. And I said this to one of the ladies at your event actually last week. Um, she came up to me, told me her name, and went off about telling me her business, what she's into and all of that, and here is my business card. So I said to her, oh, that's all well and good, but you didn't ask me what my name is. Oof. So you didn't ask me what my name is? You don't, you didn't, when you told me where, what, where your business is located, you didn't ask me where I stay or if mm. I stay in the area. You just assumed that you could offer me your business so it's one of the mistakes that a lot of people make when they're trying to sell. I introduce myself, but I don't ask you any question about you. So always start off a sales, whether you're selling a water, whatever it is, ask the person's name. Be interested in them. Otherwise, they feel like you're just trying to take advantage of them and sell them something, and then they shut down. You've already stepped, you've gone back by about 80% by not taking interest in the person you're trying to sell to. So it's very important that you ask people their name when you're trying to sell them something straight after you introduce yourself. You must ask for their name. Um, if you're trying to sell someone something, you should also know if they're family, if they're a family person or not. Mm. Because you could upsell while you're selling one product. You could end up selling two or three because they've got family. So knowing your customer you, is very important. You can never, never underestimate the power of that. Now, you now. I mean, the company is set up in eight different African countries, mm -hmm. right? How did that feel, right? Because I think oftentimes we talk about dreaming big, but to actually see it materializing where you're launching in the mm -hmm. first country, the second, and the third. How did that feel? And because I think I, I latch that. I'd like to latch that question on the back of the imposter syndrome. Mm. When you sort of sit in spaces and you question, do I even deserve to even sit or even mm. be here? And you feel like pinching yourself. Maybe oh, share, yeah. share that moment, uh, that oh, private yeah. and personal moment with us. Um, so before, before I joined the family business, I was that person that, or be rather before we started HealthGuard, I was, I'm that person where if we're having a training, I would help you set up and then I'll go sit at the back. And I would help you take stuff to the stage it's not because I know, I know, I knew my power and my position in the organization, but I was always like, please let me help you set, set this up and I'll go to the back. 
So I didn't feel that I needed to be up in front or I should be up in front. I just wanted to be behind. And we started this company and we're saying, okay, maybe in about two or three years, we would then launch a South African company and take it from there. That was our plan. Yeah. But then in 2020, while we're busy lockdown, sure, the lockdown did a lot of things to so many people, including mind games. We then decided <coughs> that we were going to put in a bid to buy Ascendis Health Direct, which was the company that we were presenting in Nigeria previously. Mm. So we put in a bid and there was um, an American company, actually, that was counter bidding at the time. And we won the bid and we found ourselves one day we only had Nigeria. The next day we had South Africa, Swaziland, Lesotho, Namibia. And we're like, huh, how do you go from having one child to five children <laughs> in the space of a few months? Mm. So um, it was a very big moment for us. And the more we, we then we, we started having people interested in us coming to their countries. We had interest in Ghana. Uganda wanted to get going. So all of those people, we had people asking us for products in the U.S. So we just kept, you know, and at a point, even the Francophone countries in Africa, they're asking us for our product and our company to come in. And I'm like, guys, I need to learn French again so that nobody plays me for a fool when I come there. <laughs> and I actually started taking French classes again mm, last year. Mm, mm. So now I can, I can hold my ground a little bit with French. So... Um, Sometimes I wake up and I think, a few years ago, we were not here. Yeah. Be before COVID started, when we launched HealthGuard, I did not imagine that within two years of launching, we would be in so many African countries. But by some grace, we are. So now I think to myself that it's a blessing and it's a gift that God has given to us. And we need to nurture that gift. We need to take care of it. We need to make sure that that it, it, it grows bigger and that the people that God has entrusted us with, that when they come in, in touch with healthcare, their lives are actually changed, either by our products or by our commissions that we pay out. That is my one big prayer. You know, that nobody comes into healthcare without having a positive impact in their lives. And I work every day to make sure that we stay true to that. So, yes, there are days that I still wake up and I'm like, wow. Even my kids sometimes remind me that, yeah, mommy, you know, it's, I think you're doing well. Like, <laughs> I think so too. So. <laughs> and I mean, you know, we, I think as, as, as someone who's also, who's an entrepreneur myself, uh, I read a lot of books, you listen to a lot of podcasts, and a lot of great people such as yourself have got, some believe in routines, some believe in mantras. What is that one thing for you? Or not even one thing, but what is some of these things for you that keep you channeled and, and, and keep you honed in so that you're able to get back on your feet each and every day and mm -hmm. go at it? Because entrepreneurship in and itself, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I must say, in, sure. in everything you've spoken and said today, you make it look fabulous. Oh, gosh. Fabulous. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy I make it look fabulous. Because when we are not looking like this, I can promise you we're trying to, sometimes there are days you want to just pull out your hair. There are actually days that I have woken up and loosened my hair because of how stressful mm. <laughs> the, the period was. And then I call my hairdresser like, I took out my hair again. And it's like, really? <laughs> so um, if I get to an extreme space of stress, I actually take out my braids and my weaves. That's the first thing I do. And I just stand in the shower and just pour water from my head to my toes. But that's a once in a while thing. Um, reading books are great, by the way. But I'll tell you, sometimes I find myself a bit of an odd one. Mm. Um, I sleep late. I don't encourage people to do that, but that's, it's just me. I can never get myself to sleep early. But that's because my mind is always working. There's always something my mind is working on and all of that. But the one thing I do is I watch action movies. Mm. Or, look, they have to either be killing somebody <laughs> or be beating somebody up. Yeah. 
uh, because I can't physically go beat up anybody. Yeah. So, but my, <laughs> but you know, things are tough. Yeah. Business is tough. So, I'm like, when I want to get away, I just watch a movie or I read a book that is an action or thriller where they are trying to catch a killer or something like that. And that is actually my getaway too. Um, my husband thinks I'm crazy for doing that, but <laughs> hey, it is it is what it is. Because mm -hmm. he says to me sometimes, that movie is too violent. I'm like, yeah, business is also very violent, <laughs> but I can't do anything about the business right now, so I'm going to watch this person yeah. get beat up, and that yeah. will be it. And then, I mean, just, just, I mean, just let me in on this, uh, Lovelyn. I mean, in your sort of early career, your entrepreneurial journey, mm. did you have any mentors um, in, in mm. you know, just helping you navigate through the journey? And I think how important is that to sort of mm. latch on to, um, you know, mentorship, whether it's mm. personal or, you know, it's through just following someone? So um, I've always been a very big believer in identifying the mentors that are in your direct circle first before you start looking at your Oprah Winfrey or somebody else out there that is thousands of kilometers away that don't even know whether you exist or not. So my, my mentor and my, and my person is actually my mom. Mm. She, because I just feel I've, she's always been that person that I have seen her struggles and have, I have seen how she has overcome it and how strong of a person she has been and how gracefully she has taken everything that life has given to her. It's not something that I have to read in a book. It's something that I have lived through. I have experienced it and I, can, I have seen the lessons and I have learned the lessons. Um, so she is my number one, um, number one any day. But, you know, um, you then look at people. When it comes to overall um, outside people, I tend to take a bit from this person, a bit from that person. Um, I did mention, mention Oprah. And the reason I mention her is... I just look at how how she managed to grow her net her net worth and her net work, mm -hmm. and I I mm -hmm. when I look at her sometimes I look at I I can see the hard work that she put in to overcome all of the challenges that she went through, and then I look at someone like President Obama of um, of the U.S. and yes, he's a man, but hey, he was still the mm -hmm. first black president Sorry. like what a huge thing he had to overcome to become that. And I try to take their successes. And as well, I don't, one of the things I don't do is to idolize a person as if they are perfect. Mm. Because people are never perfect. Mm. So even people that I have learned lessons from that are far away from me, even my mother isn't <coughs> perfect. So... I look at them and I say, okay, this person has done this, great. This is the lesson I've learned from them. But they've also misstepped here. And I recognize that. And I will not take, I will try my best not to make that mistake. So you have to take people, you have to treat people like people. Learn from what they have done well yeah. that relates to you. Don't try to be them. And, and I find that a lot of some of the young people out there these days becoming influencers or whatever they're trying to be, they're really trying to be somebody else mm. instead of taking lessons from that person to be a better version of themselves. Now, there's no way you can really build yourself as an entrepreneur or as a business owner without sacrifice. And I mm -hmm. think much to your comment around young people, and just individuals in general, you want the prize, but not the sacrifice. Mm. How important is it to put your head down, sacrifice, you know, distance yourself away from things that distract you and to focus on the journey? It can be quite challenging. Um, and to be quite honest, when it comes to being a woman and trying to do what I do and be successful at it, you give up quite a bit in terms of family as well. Um, for, I, I'm married, and 
you know, people see, when people see my, me and my husband in, in pictures of things like that, they, one, one person actually referred to us as the perfect couple. And I'm like, there's no such thing under the sun. So just get that out of your mind. Because it's intentional work. Because you know that the time that you spend to build this company is time away from your marriage, it's time away from your family, it's time away from your children. And you need to find a way to always balance that. I'm a boss in my office. I'm a boss to people out there. But to my spouse, I'm a partner. I cannot come home and also be his boss. Mm -hmm. um, and I cannot come home and also be his subordinate. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. And he knows me. <laughs> mm -hmm. He knows the kind of person he married. Um, but it's that I'm still trying to, it's, I'm not yet there. You know, I'm still trying to balance all of it and trying to try to make it work. Bless their heart, my kids are little, so they understand mommy's got to work. But when I'm at home, um, we still play the, you know, the one said to me, hide and seek last night. And I really needed to work. Mm. So I was on the phone and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have to call you back. I need to play hide and seek. Mm. And I hung up and I went and I played hide and seek with my, with my kid. So... As an entrepreneur, especially in, when you're growing and even when you get to the top, you need to be able to find a balance with your family and your business. You need to know where to draw the line. Um, you can't respect people outside and not respect your family inside. Mm. You need to respect both. And that's the only way you get the support you need from inside to keep doing what you do outside. Uh, but at the same time, you need to have an understanding family. If you don't have an understanding spouse, unfortunately, you're not going to get very far mm. because it's either going to hold you back or your marriage is going to break. It's one or the other. And I find that I'm starting to see that quite a number of women are getting into that space where they're getting into divorces because they are trying to build their careers, but they don't have that there's no proper balance at home or they don't have the necessary support at home. Mm -hmm. So I don't blame them. I don't judge people because I'm not in their situation. In my situation, I can only tell you, I'm trying my best and I don't have it all figured out. The, but the most important thing is I am trying my best and that counts for a whole lot. Yeah. Now, Lavlin, you know, I think one of the, I don't know, pinnacle questions we ask is, if you had an opportunity to talk to the younger Lavlin, what mm. would you say to her? Oh, gosh. Either Oof. to do more of or to do less of? Mm. Just to name anything. What I would say to the younger Lavlin is don't be so aggressive. Mm. Um, as a teenager, I could get really worked up and very, like, I could lash out, even in my early 20s. I could go at you like, shish, I was a firecracker. Um, but over time, I started to, and this was actually more in recent years, not maybe about three, three years, I started consciously, I started making a conscious effort to, to have more control of myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I would say to my, to my younger self. Be more control. Be be in more control of me, and not let outside forces determine my reaction or my decision to anything. That's it for today. If you like that podcast, show us some love and share it with your network. Once again, follow us on all of our social media platforms. Hashtag join us for tea, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Shout out to Joe Public for making this possible. Remember, Sisonke Rikaufela and Foster Njengom Zegezege.